Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining our webinar uh, titled Building uh, Better Systems for Resilient and Sustainable Futures. Um, this is part of the Bond Water uh, Lecture Series. Um, I'll just uh, say a few words um, before we launch uh, into our webinar. Uh, we have three speakers uh, who I'll introduce uh, as you know, the time comes when they have to speak. Um, Professor Christian Borgermeister will deliver the welcome remarks. And Jonathan Lautze and myself, uh, we will be facilitating. And of course, with technical support from Max Voigt. Okay, so now the COVID-19 pandemic, as we can all agree, has exposed vulnerable regions and systems, including water, food, energy, and of course, the health systems. Um, as most governments are still focused on the immediate response to the pandemic, uh, we need to also start thinking about building more robust and resilient systems in the future. Now, this nexus of approach um, incorporates the systems approach, but how do we make it more resilient uh, against future shocks and disruptions? So that is the main purpose uh, or main topic of the webinar today. And uh, now I'd like to uh, request Professor Christian Borgermeister, Director of CEF, Center for Development Research, to say a few words to open today's webinar. So to you, Christian. Thank you, Luna, for, for the kind words. Um, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear participants, let me start with um, a couple of words that our a uh, friend and uh, one of the founders of the Bonn Water Lecture Series, Janusz Bogardi, uh, sent us today. Unfortunately, Janusz uh, can't be with us um, today, but he's um, sending the following words on the, if you want to call it, the virtual rejuvenation of the Bonn Water Lecture Series. Um, more than 15 years ago, several entities of the, the scientific scene here in Bonn conceived and initiated this uh, water lecture series. The first presentation of this sequence dealt with the aftermath and research needs emanating from the devastating Indian Ocean tsunami, which happened on the 26th of December 2004. The swift extreme event exposed several hundred thousand and killed almost 200,000 people along the shore of the ocean within a couple of hours never before became vulnerability so brutally apparent. Nature's fourth re force revealed fundamental weaknesses and unpreparedness of our otherwise so achievement conscious societies. In 2020, a mere 15 years after this catastrophic event, the COVID-19 pandemic provides again a merciless show of the same vulnerability. While the health hazard compared to a tsunami is a creeping one, but its global scale and still increasing number of victims manifest the magnitude of the challenge the whole world is facing presently. Water lecture series or other discussion rounds alone cannot change the world or teach people the merits of preparedness. We need a healthy dose of humbleness to be injected into our we are the master of the universe style ego. But remaining silent would be a great mistake of the scientific communities. Unfolding disasters are not only to be confronted, but the inherent lessons are to be learned. The virtually rejuvenated water lecture series in Bonn aim to contribute to a more secure and more sustainable world. Looking at problems through the water lens may appropriately magnify the to-dos. Discussion may lead to common understanding and ultimately to consensus decision how to turn our vulnerably world into a sustainable place for all. Without addressing the deep-rooted and often neglected vulnerability, our cherished objectives of resilience remains compromised. In this spirit, I wish the Bonn Water Lecture Series a successful virtual re rejuvenation, enriching debates, provoking breakthrough thoughts and actions. 20th of June, 2020, Janos Bogardi. This is what I am delivering from uh, Janos. And let me say just a couple of words to the webinar that is going to start in a sec from now. 
most governments are currently focused on developing immediate response plans for the COVID-19 pandemic. The primary focus so far has been managing the health risks. So this focus has progressively been balanced against uh, preservation of livelihoods and economies. Actually, very often this is presented as a trade-off. As the impact of the virus slows down in certain regions, there is more and more discussion about a post-COVID-19 world, a world that might be characterized by a new normal. The phrase building back better has reemerged. There is ambition to build more sustainable and robust systems that can withstand future shocks and disruptions while supporting sustainability in all its dimensions, meaning environmentally, environmental, economic, and social. This webinar today is about looking towards the next steps as we start thinking in more concrete terms about building more robust and resilient systems. And with these few words, I would um, first of all thank Luna and her colleagues for organizing this webinar, webinar and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the presentations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Luna. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. Um, I'd like to now, um, without much ado, introduce our first speaker for today, Professor Dr. Mariella Evers. She's head of the working group Ecohydrology and Water Resources Management at the University of Bonn, and she's also the UNESCO Chair for Human Water Systems. Um, so, Mariella, over to you. Thanks a lot, Luna, for all these kind words and uh, to, for the introduction. And thanks a lot um, for the uh, for organizing this webinar, which is really uh, exciting, and I really appreciate it. Now I try to share my screen. Okay, now you can see my slides. Okay, here we go. Yeah, health and water and environment is highly interrelated. Uh, the interaction between humans and uh, water is regarded already in many, many concepts, so like integrated water resources management, uh, social hydrology, water risk, resilience, and you, and you name it. And uh, normally human beings are considered as uh, impacting factors on the uh, hydrological system or consumers, but uh, in, all, in other perspectives also the well-being is, is integrated. Um, and uh, looked at and uh, probably helped this aspect of the of the well-being part and uh, by the way well-being so this is the picture is taken uh, from the Adya River in Chennai uh, which is highly polluted by the way an integrated concept with with the health of the focal aspects is also existing so it's developed and also applied and it's called one health and uh, but probably this concept is not yet uh, recognized so much in the in the world, world, uh, water world, and uh, I thought it's worth to to have a look at this. And as I'm a water person, I will highlight or I will concentrate on the water aspects. Um, health is highly related uh, to water and environment. These are a couple of, or let's, let's say, the major diseases uh, which are dependent on, on environmental factors uh, like diarrhea, uh, malaria, or tisthosomiasis. And I want to draw your attention to this third column, the percentage of total burden attributable to environmental factors. And it's very, very much the water, the water aspects. So uh, the diarrhea, it's what supply, sanitation, and hygiene. And uh, probably that's not very much astonish astonishing. Um, but other aspects are also uh, related or diseases, so like malaria, but also uh, schistomosiasis is, is the water resources management. It's not only the supply and sanitation and hygiene, but also the, the management of the water resources. And I want to give you later a, a one, one reason uh, I want to explain why uh, this is the case. So it's, it's uh, looking at the, at the broader scope. The water health taxes. So there is of course 
yeah, we know what is essential for for human being and life, but also uh, to the other side, for, like diseases. So there can be infections uh, due to contaminated water, or also to exposure, uh, which then if you have a wound or something like that. We can distinguish two uh, different um, ways of uh, infection. So the waterborne diseases such as cholera or hepatitis, with, when, it's, when it comes to like, for instance, a bacteria in the water itself, in the, in the water body, and the vector-borne diseases like malaria or dengue, where the vector is living in a, in a water-related habitat. Um, and also floods is of, of course also an issue for, for, for health uh, uh, and uh, water risk. But I don't want to stress this today. The availability and access to water and sanitation, so hygiene, wash services is fundamental to fighting virus infections and preserving the health and well-being. COVID-19 will not be stopped without access to safe water for people living in vulnerability. And also, uh, as Chris had already highlighted, uh, or John Spogadi, uh, it, it's uh, very much related also the, to the vulnerability aspect um, that people uh, with a higher vulnerability are more um, successful to, to the to water, water issues, uh, to, to health issues like COVID. Coming now to the One Health concept, what I want to briefly introduce only, since I have only a couple of minutes. Um, the One Health concept adopts an integrated perspective of health, uh, recognizing intrinsic interconnection between humans, animals, and environmental health. Uh, consequently, the environmental, social, and economic system interacts with and shape One Health. Um, you can see so th these three elements and the interrelation. Um, and uh, we are running uh, right now a graduate school. Um, actually, Kristen is a speaker of the graduate school with 13 PhD projects. Um, and one of these projects I want to present you briefly uh, in a minute. Maybe you can see here um, the intersection of human environment and animal health domains like drinking water sources or pesticides on food sources or food or from food insecurity. As we all know these figures, so water scarcity affects more than 40% of the global population and is projected to rise. Over 1.7 billion people are currently living in river basin where water use uh, exceeds uh, the re recharge. And uh, yeah, more than um, 2 billion people lack access to basic sanitation services. Uh, and many, many people, uh, about maybe 900 million people, have to continue to practice open efficacy. And this is an issue, and then of course, affecting also the environmental system and vice versa, the health system. Um, so there's a lot of threat here, and probably there's uh, even more threat when it comes to the development of the water resources. Um, so there's, uh, uh, yeah, that's already water stress in many regions of the world. And what this uh, map is showing, uh, which is uh, provided by European Commission, is the risk, the global drought risk and water stress in uh, many regions of the world when it comes uh, uh, when you're looking at risk then the uh, also agriculture and population uh, and other needs are included and this is probably um, to increase um, especially when it comes to drier uh, conditions in many regions what is su suspected or ex uh, expected due to climate change and there's already yeah, an issue in many regions, as, as, as we can see. And not only water quantity is very important uh, for well-being and health, um, also the water quality, of course, and the water quality is also related to the quantity. Since we have, or if we have less water, we have less dilution of contaminants, for instance, and higher concentration of, uh, of contaminants. So this is, and this is the sea scenario in the drier future in 2050, 
where we can see uh, increased risk uh, due to water quality. And uh, just to mention, um, before I come to, my, to the aspect of One Health's uh, PhD, um, that of course water bodies are essential also for, for food production, also that themselves like fish and the proteins generated by fish, but also other ecosystem services like uh, the reduction of nutrients or um, CO2 uh, and other, other water related ecosystem, ecosystem services. So water is crucial. And coming now to the, the one example where the One Health uh, uh, concept is applied, I would like to introduce you to the PhD project, which is uh, Joshua Tayal is undertaking uh, on the linking land use dynamics and water systems in Accra, in the uh, Accra metropolitan area, with the One Health uh, perspective. The metropolitan area or the water supply is highly dependent on surface water. But surface water is very much uh, contaminated and polluted uh, with fecal matter, with plastic, uh, heavy metal and so on. And uh, lots of problems due to this fact, uh, so like cholera, but also other, other diseases like uh, schistosomiasis and uh, Joshua is uh, mainly fo focusing on, on this uh, disease. It's also called snail fever or Villatiosa or Bilharsia, uh, which is called by parasitic flatworm. And uh, so this is just an illustration of where the uh, rivers are looking like. You, so you can uh, imagine that there is also already by, by looking at the, the, the yeah. Um, a water quality problem, so to say. What he found out is that, so the, this worm is dependent on snails as a, as a tr transmission host, and uh, in that areas where high numbers of snails are to be, be found, there's also a high distribution or high number of people observed uh, of, uh, with blood and urine. And, and, uh, Blood in uh, urine is the indicator for for this disease, and there's also a high number of uh, open defecation in that area. So you can see the interlinkage here, and very interesting. What he found out is the by interviewing um, more than 300 school children, 27 of them had the blood in the urine, uh, and looking at how they have contact with the water. It's not only yeah, uh, washing or drinking, uh, but it's also fetching water and swimming. Uh, so, and that's not only uh, once in a month, but uh, very often. So you can see the interrelation of these behavior. And of course, it, it's also used as a, uh, for uh, or the river as a, as a toilet because of, of lacking of the, the sanitation facilities. And the next step, uh, would be to look at the habitat for the snail in order to identify if there is a potential, um, let's say, uh, access to, to uh, getting a bigger picture to, to solve this, uh, yeah, to solve the problem or to get an idea of how, how to, how to uh, address these uh, disease problems. And okay. a quick reminder, you have another two minutes or so, so that we don't go over time. I can do it. <laughs> Thank you. I, so my key message is health, is, health aspect is of course crucial to incorporate in resilience concepts and water is system relevant. We're looking at health issues, uh, you, you have to look at the water and not only uh, the, the tap water, but the whole system and uh, looking for the water resource management, also with water quality, quality, the habitats and so on. Um, and there is uh, the various threats to the to the water system. You name it, like climate change, or polluted over exploitation. I mentioned just a couple of them. And I think the system approach system approach is very much needed uh, to be to investigate to understand the system and to be better prepared for potential futures in order to identify 
possible threats and possible answers to the to these threats. So the system approach uh, maybe not so so much important uh, what what exact uh, concept like resilience or whatever, but system approach and system like system dynamics for instance. I think it's very much or very very important. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Ehlers. Um, uh, okay, so now we move on to our second presentation. Um, we have Jeff Operman, who is the Global Fresh Water Lead Scientist from WWF US. And he's going to talk to us about resilient infrastructure. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, Great. Well, I want to thank uh, everybody for uh, joining this and, and thanking the organizers for hosting this, um, this webinar. And thinking about the role of freshwater ecosystems in health, um, there are, of course, a number of direct connections to infectious disease, as Marielle just uh, described, but also, as she just described, taking a One Health framing, um, we can see that Freshwater ecosystems and human health are related in a variety of, of, of broader ways. So I'm going to focus on two of those uh, ways that freshwater ecosystems and the health of those ecosystems are related to the health of communities and people, um, and then talk about how those are influenced by infrastructure. Uh, and so the idea that I'll be presenting is that if we can build more resilient infrastructure, uh, that can allow us to have more resilient and healthy ecosystems, uh, which are a, a key foundation for human health. And so the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has caused us to really focus on these connections um, and, and therefore to, to really try to think with more imagination about these, kind of, uh, these connections, about how we can build a safer world and the role of infrastructure and ecosystems um, uh, is critical to that. So I'll be focusing on food security uh, that comes from freshwater systems and disaster risk reduction um, that also comes from how we manage freshwater systems. Um, so freshwater fisheries uh, are an important source of protein globally. Um, the official estimates are about 12 million tons uh, are harvested annually from freshwater lakes and rivers. Um, although as many people know, freshwater fisheries tend to be underreported. Um, and so therefore, other studies that have looked at household consumption surveys, uh, they often conclude that there's potentially at least twice as much, in, if, if not more, um, harvest from freshwater systems. So it could be you know, 24 or 30 million tons annually or even more. Um, and this amount of protein coming from rivers uh, feeds hundreds of millions of people. It's the primary source of protein for hundreds of millions of people, and at least 60 million people derive their livelihoods. Um, and so this is an important component of food security, um, of access to micronutrients. Uh, so this is a, a key component of health, uh, in, particularly in rural communities, in, in uh, Africa and Asia in particular. Um, now, how does that relate to infrastructure? Well, River fisheries in particular depend on aspects of the river ecosystem, such as the patterns of natural flow regime, um, the ability of fish to migrate up and down stream to spawning habitats, the ability of fish to move laterally from the river into floodplains and wetlands, um, and the continual flow of nutrients and sediment that drive food webs that the fisheries depend upon. Well, infrastructure, particularly dams, interacts with all those processes that I just named. So here you can see um, a dam on the, uh, the Saison River in Cambodia. Obviously, it's a barrier to up and downstream migration. There is no fish passage. Um, and you can also see it intercepting the plume of sediment and nutrients that are coming down um, the Shreifok River and entering the reservoir. Um, and this happens to be in the Mekong Basin, which has the most important fisheries, the freshwater fisheries in the world. So research that WWF led uh, looked at the interaction between dams and rivers and free-flowing rivers and all those aspects of connectivity and flow that I just mentioned that are so important to freshwater fisheries. And so last year, we, we came up with this um, 
map of the world's free-flowing rivers, so rivers that still retain those characteristics of connectivity and natural flow. And here we see highlighted uh, in, in the thick lines the, the, the major rivers, the, the long rivers, where the dark blue are still considered free-flowing um, by a set of criteria about connectivity and flow, et cetera. Um, and the red lines are those rivers that have lost their free-flowing status. So we can see that um, free-flowing rivers uh, that still remain are concentrated in the Amazon basin, the Congo basin, um, and, and basically the very northern regions. Um, and in Asia, there's only two free-flowing long rivers left, and those are both in Myanmar, um, the Salween and the Irrawaddy. If you can see my cursor, I'm, I'm hovering over that right now. Um, now, bringing it back to infrastructure, uh, there are thousands of hydropower dams that are in various stages of being proposed or planned around the world. These are these red and orange dots. Um, and if you look at the, at the projections of the IPCC, for example, of what the world needs to meet a low carbon, uh, to meet the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reductions targets, the world would need to approximately double or more the hydropower uh, capacity globally. Um, and what would that do to free-flowing rivers? Well, going back to this map, if these dams that are that um, are in the various stages of the planning process, if those dams were to be built, what we see here is in yellow are previously free-flowing rivers that are no longer free-flowing uh, in yellow. And this loss of free-flowing rivers is concentrated in those parts of the world where freshwater fisheries are most important to human communities including the Amazon, much of Africa, and in um, South Asia, in, in, in Nepal, India, and Southeast Asia. Um, so poorly planned and poorly implemented infrastructure could have a major negative impact on uh, protein availability, micronutrients, and food security, and therefore health of these communities. Um, but we recently have been uh, working with a variety of, of researchers to study how the renewable revolution could dramatically improve conditions for free-flowing rivers and their services like fisheries. Um, so just, uh, I'll only touch on this very briefly, but for example, you can see that on the right, this is the cost of um, solar pho photovoltaic uh, generation projects, and it has declined dramatically. Um, the two lines, one line is the actual implemented cost, and the other line is the auction uh, kind of forward-looking cost. But both lines are, have declined dramatically uh, just in the past decade. Um, and as a result, solar is becoming, uh, solar and wind together are now dominating uh, investments in, in power generation around the world. And in this study called Connected and Flowing, um, we found that this, this transition to greater investment in wind and solar um, within grids that, that are functioning grids in terms of reliability um, could reduce by 90% the impacts on free flowing rivers. Um, and what we say that this calls for is that the world can have future energy systems that are low carbon, low cost, and low conflict with rivers and communities. So low C times three. So I won't go into more detail, but this report really details how that resilience infrastructure and the nexus thinking of thinking about rivers and freshwater systems and energy planning, how that nexus thinking could allow us to have these low C times three uh, future uh, power systems. Switching now to um, flood risk, and, and floods are consistently ranked as the, the uh, most negatively impactful natural disaster around the world. In 2019, there was 45 billion in damages globally from floods, and the um, World Resources Institute uh, estimated that by 2030, more than 100 million people uh, will be impacted by river flooding annually. Um, and we can see that flood risk is indeed rising. So this is looking at various um, multi-decade periods in the United States using constant dollars. And we can see that um, annual flooding has, has about doubled um, between the beginning of the last century and the beginning of this century. Uh, and, and similar trends are being observed from Europe. Um, why is that? Well, partly it's there is continued development in places that are at risk of flooding. So this is the city of Houston in 1990. This is the city of Houston in 2014. Um, and much of this later development, or most recent development, is happening in low-lying areas uh, that are developed later. 
Um, and they are indeed at higher flood risk. They also are the places that would have previously stored floodwaters during major rainfall events. Um, so what you're looking at here is a picture of dramatically increasing flood risk. Uh, and indeed in 2017, Houston experienced um, catastrophic flooding over most of the city. <clears throat> And a quick reminder, you have another three minutes or so. Great, thank you. Um, and it's not just Houston. Uh, this study by uh, Gunnarop et al. found that between now and 2030, nearly half of all global urban development will occur in areas at high risk of flooding. So we're continuing to develop in the areas at risk of flooding and flood risk is increasing. Um, this study by Hirabashi et al. Uh, is looking at <clears throat> the change in the uh, frequency of major floods. So real quick, what this is saying is what we today consider the 100-year flood, a flood that has a 1% chance of occurring. How frequently will that occur um, in, uh, by, the, by the end of this century? And you can see that in parts of the, the eastern United States and the west coast of the United States, where most of the population is, most of Latin America, much of Africa, and huge swaths of Europe, I'm sorry, huge swaths of Asia, are blue to dark blue. These are areas where what is considered today a rare flood, you would expect it you know, once in 100 years, these are places where that flood might begin to occur multiple times a decade, um, or you know, at least four or five times in a century. So a rare, rare floods are becoming common floods in much of the world, and that has huge implications for um, health and, and risk. So what, again, how does infrastructure relate to this aspect of health and risk? Looking at the Sacramento River flood management system, um, it initially depended strictly on levees, and that's what we see in the upper right, a levee, a wall right next to the river. But earlier last century, what you see in red, highlighted in red, was a major reconnection of floodplains to the river to allow floodwaters to spread out. Um, and this is one of the best examples of this in the world. So that photo in the lower right, it was my opening photo, you might have thought that was a levee failure. This is in intentional flooding of a flood bypass system. Um, and this is the Yolo bypass. This is that bypass system with the city of Sacramento in the background. This is intentionally flooded land that is able to be flooded to reduce flood risk for the city of Sacramento. And how much does it reduce risk? Well, if we look at the sequence of figures of the major flood in 1986, this red dashed line shows this is the total channel capacity of the Sacramento River as it flows through Sacramento. This is what the total discharge of that 1986 flood looked like, which looks like a catastrophe. But, and this gray line shows how much water was moving past those levees in the city of Sacramento. It almost reached the channel capacity, meaning almost flooding could have occurred, um, but it did not. And why is that? The green is how much of the water was moving through that YOLO bypass, through the, the connected floodplains, 86% where almost 90% of the flood was moving through the bypass. Um, and you can see here the massive area of the bypass compared to the skinny little river. So almost all the water is diverted into these intentionally flooded floodplains to reduce risk for Sacramento. Um, and what is this value? Well, in 2017, California had the greatest volume of precipitation ever recorded, no major flooding. The, the floodplains of the bypass continued to work. This is a combination of natural infrastructure and engineered infrastructure. It also happens to provide the best remaining floodplain habitat in the Central Valley. So it's multifunctional, um, it's contributing to resilient ecosystems, and by providing all that room for the floodwaters to spread out, it's contributing to resilient infrastructure and safety for people. So just to wrap up, resilient infrastructure is critical for maintaining ecosystem processes that benefit the health of people. Um, and that investments in these renewable power systems and nature-based solutions for flood risk can certainly be a major part of the building better recovery efforts. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff. Very interesting presentation. Um, now let's move on to the third presentation of our webinar. And we have uh, Professor Stefan Ullenbruck, who's the Strategic Program Director of Water, Food, and Ecosystems at um, IMI, uh, yeah, International Water Management Institute. Okay, Stefan, over to you. Okay, now I'm unmuted, I guess. 
my apologies. Good afternoon, good uh, evening or good morning, wherever you are. Pleasure for me to be here and try to, in the, in the next 10 minutes or so, I will try to, to make the linkages between uh, water energy and food systems. And uh, um, it, I will basically run through a couple of examples which we uh, saw in the literature to just explain the interdependencies between water, food and energy. And then also how this links to actually many more systems as the previous speaker already were introducing a, a larger One Health approach which connects animals and humans and the environmental health, uh, as well as uh, all the work that Jeff has been presenting was, was super interesting. Uh, well, let me, let me start very trivial, you know, that uh, water is needed for many processes and we have been seeing uh, an increase of the global water withdrawals over time quite, quite significantly. Currently, almost 70% goes to agriculture, a bit more than, a bit less than 20% go to industry, uh, including uh, energy production, and some 12% or so, or so are used uh, domestically. The, the total percentage of agriculture has reduced over, over the last years, but, but the absolute number has still uh, been growing up, has, has been growing. And while we, we also see that the other sectors, particular industry, and um, uh, including energy production, is increasing its share. But, but overall, all, all main sectors are increasing uh, the need for, for more water. Speaking about um, food, I will come to that later, but, but also energy is quite, hung, quite thirsty. Huh? Uh, energy needs uh, water for cooling or mining needs a lot of water as well. And uh, energy production from, from bio-based uh, materials, biofuels, is also a very thirsty way of producing. Uh, energy, but it's also the other way around. You know, water needs a lot of energy. What we see on this figure is the global consumption of electricity, which is roughly about four percent of the total electricity consumption of the world. Some four percent go to the water sector. Interesting is also to look at how that is predicted to evolve in the, in the coming uh, decades, and there's an increase of some eighty percent predicted for the next twenty-five years. And it's also interesting to where does that energy demand, uh, where does it come from? And it's interesting, it's, it's at the one end, it's a desalination is predicted to increase um, uh, the energy uh, consumption. It's clear, despite the fact that we increasingly develop, you know, better membrane technology and so to, to do uh, desalination in, in a better energy efficient way. But also interesting is to see that water transfer, so pumping water from, from a water scarce area to, to where it's needed is, is really increasing, uh, predicted to increase rapidly. And uh, also wastewater treatment is increasing uh, the energy demand, which is also not a very smart way of using energy because we know that we can actually produce nowadays uh, wastewater treatment facilities that are energy positive. So using the organic material, using the temperature of the wastewater, using the energy content, you might want to say, in the wastewater can actually help to treat the water. So instead of putting energy in, we can actually gain energy from, from wastewater treatment. But these are the predictions and we have to think if that is, is that the right way. Um, well, J Jeff already said, he said uh, like the, the hydropower capacity needs to be doubled in the next uh, 25 years or so. If I, if I got it right, there's different predictions how the, the increase of uh, the food demand uh, needs, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the food supply needs to be increased uh, probably roughly uh, 40, 50 percent in the coming uh, 30 years. Increase of energy, et cetera, et cetera, is, is uh, clear and, and predicted. So what do we do if we have an increasing demand, but uh, the resource base is actually eroding? So we be more efficient with what we have, you know? And I would like to illustrate that quickly on the uh, example of the use of water for agriculture. There's different technologies and in different ways helping us to be more efficient with the way we manage water. For instance, at the, at the local scale we can we can work with uh, breeding or biotechnology uh, to, to really improve the the water productivity the amount of uh, benefits that we generate from a given volume of water for instance generate more yields or more biomass so that's a water productivity and we we can work at, at the plant scale or we can also improve our economic practices through better irrigation techniques better soil management practices better delivery of water more efficient delivery less losses while well, i don't like the term loss so much but but there's different ways to increase uh, the, the 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 delivery and therefore the efficiency of water use at the local scale other things include um, economic instruments of so pricing or subsidies of certain things. We come to that later in my examples, as well as other policies and, and institutional arrangements uh, can help to increase water productivity. 
So at the, uh, the, what, what, what are the challenges to be more effective with, with a given resource? And the first, I, I wanna make this statement, yes, we can. We can be more efficient with the use of water to produce biomass or, or increase the yield through better irrigation technology, through uh, modern breeding, um, uh, breeding technology, et cetera. Yes, we can. However, improvements of this so-called water productivity at local scale, does that always lead to, to uh, water savings across scale? Well, the belief is that reduction in the water application, so putting less water to the plants uh, at the field scale, translates to it reducing the water consumption at, at larger scale. And the whole catchment, for instance, the reality shows the opposite. So what we learned from many cases is that if we increase the local water use efficiency, it increases the income of the farmers, which is a good thing. But uh, this often you, uh, leads to the fact that the, the extra water is not returned to the environment or, or made available for other uses. It's usually uh, used immediately. So it's the, the farmers tend to, to expand the cultivated areas or increase the cropping intensity. So they use the water as much as they can if they are allowed to do so. And that overall leads to an increased water consumption instead of conservation of water resources. And that has been shown for quite a number of case studies worldwide. There's a review paper which analyzed more than 200 cases worldwide, which basically uh, showed the, the same pattern. So increasing the efficiency does not lead to um, um, more efficiency with the resources overall. And that links what economists love to call the, the Jeffson paradox. That's a, a paradox where um, it is described that the, the increase in fuel efficiencies of cars um, if you, uh, the fuel efficiency of cars did not increase the efficiency uh, overall of the use of the resource or that we actually decreased the fuel use. No, rather the opposite. So the, the, the gains of the last decades did not lead to, to driving less, certainly not. We drive more and more. And having this more available and being more efficient with the resources led actually to an overall increase of the, war, of the use of fuel. And the same is what we see in, in, uh, ir in irrigation practices, and some people, uh, Grafton et al., they coined it as the irrigation efficiency paradox, or the rebound effect. So increasing the efficiency leads to an overall use of more of the resource. However, I need to say that here, number four, the point I want to make is that um, resource conservation has been observed as well. There's a few cases where actually uh, we, we were able to save real water resources due to um, uh, increase of efficiency measures, but that's often dependent on very strict regulatory frameworks, on, on a strong government really looking at the limits of, of the withdrawals, it re uh, enforcing the law as necessary. Another point is from, from an uh, ecosystem perspective, inefficiencies in water use are not necessarily always a bad thing. You know, uh, when, when you read, read um, classical irrigation literature, they always talk about water loss and there's no water loss, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's infiltrating uh, to the soil and, and, and uh, kind of lost to the groundwater, but that's recharge, you know, that makes water available for downstream ecosystems. So there are no real losses. It's, it's always a hydrological cycle. Let me come to the one example which I would like to introduce, and I borrowed these uh, slides from, from our uh, colleague Kakraman, and I think he's in the call, and he, he might want to chip in, in the, uh, during the discussion, and it's uh, an example for, for a nice nexus study in, in Central Asia at the transboundary river system leading to the Aral Sea, where they were studying the improvement of water use efficiencies. Uh, I need to say that uh, at the Amudaya River, uh, there, there's quite large water lifting schemes where water is lift, lifted over quite, uh, quite some distances. Here, this system uh, has a horizontal distance of some 80 kilometers and the water is lifted more than 150 meters. So that requires a lot of pumping. And about half of the irrigation schemes in Uzbekistan and 70% in Tajikistan are dependent on, on water lifting. Quick reminder, you have another two or three minutes. Sure. Yes, I, yeah, I'm going to hurry up. And, um, and interesting is to say that because the, 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 the pumps are very inefficient in terms of energy usage, 21% of the whole uh, ge uh, energy generated in Uzbekistan is used for inefficient pumping. And 60% of the energy of, of the whole Tajikistan is actually used for this. Some modeling analysis of our colleagues then were, were, were looking at, at cotton and wheat, and they could show that with more efficient uh, water use at the farm scale, you can significantly reduce 
the irrigation applications, but also the, the electricity consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions. Again, these are only modeling studies with supported some field uh, trials as well, but not large scale uh, implications of that. The results are, uh, two more slides, the results are that there's big, uh, government issued a de uh, decree saying that we want to intensify water saving technologies. You can also interpret that moving from subsidizing fuel or electricity, you, you subsidize water saving technology, which then resulted in expanding of the irrigation area and, and leads to higher productivity in uh, irrigation sector. Colleagues, I don't want to uh, summarize everything with a, with, a, with a lot of conclusions, but, but there's one more point I want to make at the very end. And, um, often we look at the water, food, energy nexus. I really appreciate that the previous speakers were already making that link to human health, animal health, and, and, and other, other ecosystem functions and services, as Jeff said. But there's many other co-benefits. They're often forgotten. And uh, this is an analysis colleagues did for, the, for, for investments of the Green, Green Climate Fund. So these are investments for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And they looked at what are the co-benefits from, for instance, a reforestation effort. What are the co-benefits economically, environmentally, socially, and from a gender point of view? And you could see that 61% of, of, the, of these uh, investments of the Green Climate Fund lead to actually more employment opportunities, to more income generation for rural people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of co-benefits, which we often don't understand, but if we are able to understand them better, to quantify them, that might really, and, and factor that in in our decision-making matrix, that might really tip the decision then uh, to, to more complex uh, nexus-based approaches instead of uh, very uh, linear approaches. With this, I would like to thank your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. I mean, that really uh, summarized very well. Um, now we move on to the discussion part of our webinar. Um, we're running a little bit late, uh, but anyway, so let's, so let's just go ahead and start. So I'd like to hand it over to Jonathan, uh, who, will, who will facilitate the first part of the discussion, and I'll jump back in um, after, after he's done. Okay, yeah, Jonathan. thanks, Luna, and thanks to the three presenters, uh, Mariella, Jeff, and Stefan. Uh, excellent presentations. Um, yeah, right. So, uh, so as Luna said, we're transitioning to the discussion portion. And uh, I wanted to start off by bringing us back to the overarching purpose of this, uh, of this webinar, which is to, to push towards answering the question, how do we make the Nexus system or Nexus approaches more resilient? You know, given the, the COVID context, which has exposed vulnerabilities, Luna and Christian pointed this out at the beginning. How do we strengthen the, the, the Nexus system approaches we're currently implementing uh, to make them more robust in the face of future shocks? Um, so, you know, we heard three great presentations, I, I think, hitting on a lot of key issues. But now I think we wanted to drill down to, to indicators. How do we measure this? What do these words really mean? When you talk about resilience, you know, we have to push towards, towards measuring that. And we need and to measure it, we need to look at indicators. So we heard a lot of interesting indicators. I was jotting them down across the presentations, you know, on water-related disease, drought risk, and fish, and Mariella's presentation. Jeff was, I think, pushing towards issues around energy diversification um, and, and how nature-based flood management is, which is great. And I think Stefan was talking about efficiency and uh, how, how true or real efficiency is rather than paradoxical. So in a way, these are all great indicators. But now if you want to look back towards WEF Nexus frameworks and say, which of these things can we grab and incorporate into our frameworks to make them more robust? What are those key uh, resilience indicators and how would we monitor them? Uh, so it, 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 with that question, I would, I would turn back to the panelists, uh, uh, perhaps starting with Mariella since, since she went first and ask that question. One bit of housekeeping as I'm posing these questions, audience members can type in uh, and pose questions as they like. So, so Mariella, would you like to take a stab at responding to that question? Thank you, Jonathan. Of course, a very uh, difficult question. <laughs> uh, but, but what I have to admit that I don't think that one indicator is covering uh, the, 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 the scope of, of, of uh, or can cover the scope of one, one system or a couple of indicators. As we learned a couple of um, um, 
contexts. Um, we work a lot also with flood risk, for instance, but in, uh, in other issues that we learn that vulnerability and also resilience is very much context, context specific. And looking at the context, uh, of course, there are a range of indicators which are um, existent and also approved sometimes. Um, but often, these certain indicators much more important in, 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 a, in a certain context than in other in another context. And I think that that is very important to have in have in mind. For instance, we work with multi criteria ana analysis and or could be also other approaches. But I think that that is important to have in mind that it's context specific. And when, 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 if there's something good with COVID-19 is that we learned and, and also, also the politicians and decision, decision makers learned about the, the complexity of our systems and that we need iterative approaches and, and, uh, and, and, and learning approaches and, and also to, to think in systems because there are effects and, and cascading effect and so on and so on as we can see right now and I think this is a learning lesson and, um, um, and this is uh, yeah again what, what I said earlier uh, looking at the system and using system dynamics or other system approaches uh, is, is very important to uh, yeah to, to make or to, to think of resilient, let's say, possibilities or solutions. Good, okay, Va valid points. Context, specificity, multi-criteria, iteration and systems, all, all valid and important. Um, could I pass it over to Jeff now to see if he'd like to add anything? Sure, I'll just say something pretty quickly about the, the value of a, of a simple indi indicator to um, compel nexus thinking. So for example, with uh, nature-based solutions for flood risk, uh, really, the ultimate indicator is number of people who benefit from reduced flood risk. And that, that seems quite simple and obvious, um, but that really compels uh, nexus thinking or integrative thinking on these types of projects. Um, I think conservationists often uh, default to saying, well, nature-based solutions are good. They have co-benefits. We're going to see a lot of values to ecosystems. Uh, it's better than levees and flood walls, and it's it's a bit generic. It's a bit generalized, um, and that's all true. And, and you know, it's it's good to be helping ecosystems and and getting multiple benefits. But at the end of the day, if you want to be relevant in this world, you have to boil it down to number of people with reduced flood risk. That's the fundamental indicator. So um, that is a discipline. When you think in terms of that type of indicator, that's a discipline that would that would compel advocates of, of green infrastructure nature-based solutions to think about the real essence of, of what they're proposing and and to ma make sure that it meets uh meets the expectations okay good 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 stuff um stefan would you like to add anything well a lot of wait a minute oops a lot of good things are already said but but measuring resilience is, is uh, super difficult and, and in a nexus approach i think all what has been said about multi criteria and so is all i agree with it but it, look at a person you know if, if a doctor calls uh, that person is quite resilient you know he, what, what does the doctor measure you know uh, he or she might might kind of uh, the, the overall health of a patient is is uh, depending on so many different parameters and and in in science we often kind of meet, we come from a certain direction and if we are maybe a biophysical trained scientist, Scientists, we, we measure the ecosystem resilience or system resilience from a biophysical point of view. We measure flows or, or uh, biomass production or, or indicators for biodiversity or whatever we do. But, but it's a whole system, and it's including all the, the, the human systems, which where we need complete different survey instruments for social scientists, um, are maybe very common, but, but for others, maybe less easy to understand and, and also uh, very complex to combine. So and there's also not a number from one to ten, and this system is resilient or healthy, and therefore uh, easier to to um, to bounce back after. Damn it! After disturbance and specific uh, assessment, and I, I believe uh, comparative studies, so quite similar systems, help us to get a better handle on 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 assessing the resilience of certain system. But there's not a a unique single. Uh, indicator or, or composite indicator that 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 says it all. Okay, good, interesting perspective, and I'm scanning over the chats as as the, as you guys are responding. Um, so I particularly like the chat from uh, uh, Srinivasa. 
who talks about difference between uh, uh, process-based indicators and outcome-based indicators. So the one I think Jeff was pushing to earlier was more of an out outcome-based indicator and, and less so a, a process-focused one around governance that, that underlies it. But it's interesting to unpack that uh, and capture the different aspects of it. And, and points well made across the board, I think, in terms of, uh, you're right, the context specificity, I think, Stefan, which you're picking up on, which, which Mariella was pointing out, and the need to think about multi-criteria. So, so all um, valid and, and, and worthwhile points. Um, I think we have time for the second question. Uh, I'm looking at Luna for permission. I'll hand it back to Luna because I think it's quite a valuable one. Can I hand it over to you, Luna, to take it forward? Okay, okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so we've all agreed. I mean, I liked, um, you know, what Mariella said, let's think in systems. I think all the speakers are, uh, you know, reinforcing this idea. Uh, but, I mean, I'd like to be the devil's advocate and then remind ourselves of IWRM, uh, which was also a great idea, but somehow uh, in implementation of this idea, of this concept, we ran into problems. I mean, of course, very context-specific problems, but we ran into problems. Uh, so, um, so the question that I'd like to first uh, pose the panelists, but uh, I would really also encourage the audience to also write in their responses, is uh, what are the next steps? So, you know, uh, we all agree that we need a systems approach. This is how we build resilience. This is how we move towards sustainable systems. But what are the next uh, steps then in, in carrying this forward? Mariella, please. <laughs> okay, I tried. The project's done. Maybe, maybe I would like to point out two, two things. Uh, first of all, we, we learned a lot during the last years uh, with these approaches, uh, really like, yeah, to understand systems and to get really an idea of, uh, about the processes. And I like very much the comment from, from the participants uh, to, for the process indicators, which is really, really important to look at. And, um, but we learn a lot about the systems and how systems are working, and, um, and this, this is very important in a lot of cases. Um, and that we have to, and this knowledge, um, yeah, uh, how we can um, uh, make this knowledge usable. So this is this is one point uh, really to get to, to make it accessible knowledge about the uh, these findings. So this is one, one key aspect, I think, uh, which is, of course, not easy. It's not only to write a review paper, it's <laughs> much more complicated. And the second point I would like to do, I, li I would like to make is uh, to work with practitioners together. Uh, politicians are often blamed, yeah, they don't understand or they don't want to see or whatever. So it's much more complex, I know that. Um, so, and, and one, one approach is to this transdisciplinary research to work with, with practitioners on, on, uh, and, and scientists together on, on uh, their problems and uh, cases and so on together to learn from each other. I think that's, that's very important. It's not easy again and uh, other aspects which make it uh, complicated or easy in the academic world. However, I, I would like to really promote this, this transdisciplinary research working together with practitioners. Okay, thank you, Mariella. To, so to just summarize, I mean, the two key ways, one is uh, invest more in capacity building, communicating, you know, this whole concept of working in systems. And second, also very important, work in practice. Uh, partnership with the practitioners and this is how we can uh, move move into implementation um, now uh, we'd like to ask Jeff um, to please uh, <laughs> we, we're running out of time yeah. we have one minute and we yeah. still have well I still want to also ask Stefan so yeah but, yeah sorry but I think this discussion is so interesting I hope everyone will stay even if we do go over a little bit <laughs> Well, real quick, the, the, the contrast you made uh, or the cautionary tale of IWRM, I think is really interesting. I think that um, what's necessary is some sort of regulatory uh, com uh, 
direction or requirement. So IAWRM in many places was encouraging integration, but perhaps without a real driver. And then the, the, those efforts can, can break up on, on the, the boulders of complexity. Um, but if there's a regulatory uh, compelling reason to, to do that integration, that can help. So I was talking about the Yolo Bypass. After decades, environmentalists had learned that it's great habitat, floodplains, uh, engineers knew it worked well from flood risk. They worked together and in, in 2015, California passed legislation opening up big funding for flood bonds, but they dictated multi-purpose flood reduction. They said, you have to get ecosystem benefits and you have to get flood risk reduction benefits. So there was a clear regulatory legislative guidance to do the integration and that compels uh, the, the integration. So I think that's, that's a way forward. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. So basically, we need to introduce regulation or regulatory mechanisms in implementing ne nexus approaches. Yes, okay. Um, now, Stefan, over to you, the same question. Thank you. Well, all the good things were said already, so what can I add? And I think what, what I can add is that we, that we should embrace the complexity of sy systems. Often we, we have too much and kind of want to simplify things and, and, and also believe in our policy advices that simply oversimplification is, is actually helpful. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's really important to understand interdependencies, really em embrace the, the whole complexity and, and come up with this kind of solutions or develop them uh, locally adaptive in, in a way that really kind of considering the whole system as, as previous speaker were already saying. And two examples for this, if I may, um, you know, all what has to do with this kind of circular economy type of thinking is, is, is the way to go. For me, the linear economic approach is, is, is not the way to go. We know that we need to re reduce and recycle and, and uh, retain in the system. Is it nutrients? Is it water? Is it, you know, energy? It's, it's always the same s system. And I think that needs to be uh, applied and also work with nature instead of against it. I think Jeff's example of rehabilitating uh, former bypass channels and, and use them as a floodplain, reactivate that with ecosystem services, with benefits for that with, with preventing flood is a, is a typical example for working with nature instead of against it. Producing agricultural produce, which is actually, which makes sense in a certain region. And maybe if you're in a water dry area, not producing water intensive crops, but, but try to import that might be a much better solution than, than try to overcome nature with, with technology uh, shortcuts, which, which sometimes don't pay off at the end. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you, Stefan. So basically, we need to borrow from the circular economy concepts and integrate that into the nexus approach. And the second is, let's try to work with nature. And this is also very valid and relevant, you know, under this global pandemic. Um, okay, now we've moved on to the last part. We're two minutes uh, over, but or three minutes. Um, but I'd like to now hand it over to um, Jonathan to uh, basically close the webinar and also give a wrap up you know, talk. Yeah, thanks, Luna. I actually think you just captured it in terms of highlighting the key points on working with nature and some of the other uh, aspects coming out of this. But overall, I think this was very interesting discussion. Um, I'm scanning the chats as we're talking and I'm seeing the one by Enos, uh, who in many ways Jeff responded to just five minutes ago, talking about leg getting it into legislation, legislation how that spurred. Uh, positive outcomes in California. So uh, interesting stuff. On the housekeeping side, um, this is going to be posted on the ZEF website, I understand. Um, and, uh, and there was one other housekeeping. Uh, Max, can we post the web's, uh, web address or the email address? The other, the last slide? Um, yes, that's not a problem. Hang on, just a second. Okay. Sorry, Jonathan, just help me. No, no, no worries. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, so this recording, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Luna, but will be, uh, or Max, will be posted here. So participants can go, uh, if they want to uh, review what was presented today, can go find it there. And I assume you'll post in the next couple of days. Um, and should anyone want to take the discussion forward further, this is an area we're actively looking to develop. And so I propose they get in touch with Luna, uh, if that's all right with you, Luna, um, um, to take forward uh, some of the ideas coming out of this. Um, and uh, any objections? 
<laughs> well, we have, um, uh, okay, so we had sent around this email address uh, for people to register and, um, uh, and yeah, so if you have more ideas on indicators for Nexus approaches, how to um, measure the performance, how to monitor them, you know, basically what we've talked about, I mean, the speakers, we've come, we've already heard a whole wealth of very good ideas, but if people want to continue this discussion, please write to this email address and Jonathan and I will facilitate whether we plan another webinar or we're also talking about coming, you know, summarizing it in a Two pager, uh, but yeah, please uh, please write to this press at press.zef at unibon.de, and uh, we'll get back to you because not everyone. I mean, we at our highest point, I had uh, noticed there were 76 participants. We've lost a few, uh, but not everyone registered, so we don't have everyone's emails address. So please, uh, you know, if you want to continue. Uh, you know, in our second webinar or in this paper that we might put together, please write to us. Okay, so then I think we're well over now. So it's just a final um, word to say thank you for all the panel to all the panelists and for all the participants, and to you, Luna, who is the primary uh, organizer of this. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have done it by myself. I mean, it's basically everyone helped out. And thank you very much, Max. Everything went smoothly. And um, yeah, thank you for supporting us technically. And I'd like to thank the speakers, Christian and Jonathan, and all of the participants who are still there hanging in to listen to us. Yeah, thank you very much. OK. All right. Great. Bye. 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 Thank you, Luna and the others. Thanks. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye.